Welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight for Ask the Expert. I'm Catherine, and I'm the virtual coordinator for the National Aphasia Association. The National Aphasia Association is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to promote public awareness and understanding of aphasia, to promote research that aims to improve the lives of people with aphasia, and to provide support to all persons with aphasia and their care partners. Tonight, we're joined by a fantastic panel of aphasia experts who will be speaking about clinical diversity issues in aphasia. Angie Cawthorn, Dr. Charles Ellis, and Dr. Dave Trina Celeste Gadsen. You'll have the opportunity to hear from each of them and ask them questions about diversity and aphasia. Please write your questions for our experts about diversity and aphasia into the Q&A section of your Zoom toolbar. And please feel free to say hello or add a comment in the chat section. Our experts will answer as many of your questions about tonight's topic as possible. We may not get to all of your questions during this webinar. So if we don't get to your question or if you think of additional questions, please feel free to email your question to answers at aphasia.org. And now I'm honored to introduce tonight's experts. First, we have Angie Cawthorn. Angie Cawthorn is dedicated to making a difference in the lives of people living with aphasia. Prior to two strokes in 2017, she was a finance professional for over 20 years. Today, she is the co-founder and president of the ARCH Network, Aphasia Resource Collaboration Hub which serves to increase awareness of and access to treatment, research, and other support services for people coping with this language disorder. Angie is co-host of the podcast Brain Friends. She is a co-leader of the NAA's Black American Aphasia Conversation Group. Angie is a founding board member of the National Aphasia Synergy and is a board member of the National Aphasia Association. She is an aphasia advocate ambassador at Temple University's Safran Center for Cognitive Neuroscience. Hello. <laughs> Next, Dr. Charles Ellis Jr., PhD, is a professor and chair of the Department of Speech, Language, and Hearing Sciences at the University of Florida. Dr. Ellis is a licensed and certified speech language pathologist who received his Bachelor of Science and Master's degree from the University of Georgia and Doctor of Philosophy degree from the University of Florida. Dr. Ellis's academic concentration focuses on adult neurogenic disorders, and he teaches courses related to aphasia and cognitive disorders. His research is designed to understand outcomes associated with adult neurologically based disorders of communication and factors that contribute to the lack of equity in service provision and outcome disparities that exist among African Americans and other underrepresented minority groups. Dr. Ellis was awarded the American Speech Language Hearing Association Certificate of Recognition for Special Contribution in Multicultural Affairs in 2011. In 2014, he was awarded Fellowship of the American Speech Language Hearing Association. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me tonight. And last but not least, Dr. Dave Trina Celeste Gadsen is a neuroscientist and ASHA certified speech language pathologist with expertise in adult neurological rehabilitation and health outcomes research. As a clinical researcher, she is interested in health equity in aphasia and the influence of health disparities on minority stroke and cancer survivors. Dr. Gadsen currently studies how to connect science and research to policy at the National Institute of Health 
including patient engagement in cancer therapeutic clinical trials. Most rewardingly, Dr. Celeste is the co-host of the Brain Friends podcast, a space for neuro nerds and stroke survivors to talk all things aphasia, language recovery, and community. With listeners in over 53 countries, laugh and learn with two stakeholders determined to make a difference in aphasia advocacy. And Dr. Celeste is going to kick it off for us tonight. Yes, thank you so much um, for having us today. Um, let me start the presentation. Okay. Um, so you got in my introduction and so excited to be here with you all today. A little bit about me. I um, co host a Brain Friends podcast with Angie, which started as a way to really disseminate science. Um, I was getting uh, a little discouraged with the rejection letters of manuscripts and grants. And I just wanted to talk with people with aphasia and our conversations were so informative that we started a podcast. I'm also a speech language pathologist and a parent, a plant parent. I didn't become a parent until 2011 when I had a patient named Miss Pat. And Miss Pat was an African-American female she had um, a heart disease, she had had two strokes and with no residual deficits until her stroke. And she was diagnosed with left temporal um, priorital um, infarct would left her with aphasia. And so this is a picture of a plant that Ms. Uh, Pat taught me how to plant as part of our therapy activity. And so her role with someone with Wernicke's aphasia was to help me plant this plant, uh, pot this plant, and um, yeah, as part of our therapy. And in 2019, this is now Miss Pat. Miss Pat grew so much that I had to divide her into two separate containers, which really started the blooming of my research and how I understood that individuals with aphasia can really teach us a lot. And so when we think about cultural um, and clinical diversity issues in aphasia, it really starts at the stroke. Um, so we know that minority and lower earning social economic groups have a higher stroke occurrence. They're less likely to be um, treated with TPA, which is a clot busting drug due to delayed hospital arrival or stroke severity and their access to rehabilitation also is influence where individuals that are higher income earners often have greater resources like speech therapy or advanced hospital resources. So this led me to really want to understand what disparities we also have in aphasia. And we found that black stroke survivors with aphasia have lower behavioral performance than white stroke survivors with aphasia. And I wanted to know a little bit more about this. We know that some of this is due to what they consider upstream factors. So things such as food deserts, lack of neighborhood walkability, fewer pharmacies, and even supermarkets. I live here in Washington, DC, and this is a map of um, the District of Columbia here. And the areas in red are areas with fewer supermarket locations, lower household income, and transportation access. These areas, which are Ward 7 and 8, are predominantly occupied by Black Americans or individuals of African descent. I did my postdoc at Georgetown University, and one of the things that we studied was why was the aphasia severity different? And we found that the aphasia severity was modulated by the race and the lesion size of these individuals, meaning that although black and white stroke survivors 
had the same area of damage, meaning aphasia is aphasia, it's going to be in that left hemisphere of the brain, black stroke survivors had a larger lesion size, which you see right here, and even the median income for black individuals was lower than white individuals. The other thing that I found, which was really interesting, was that there was a baseline difference on the Western aphasia battery of where black individuals at baseline scored 69, where white individuals had a median of 75. And so this baseline difference was also something that was interesting. And so what we found was that the interaction, trying to move my screen here, what we found was that race and lesion size influence an individual's aphasia severity. So if we look here, we see that black and white stroke survivors with smaller lesions perform similarly on the Western aphasia battery but larger strokes resulted in a more severe damage than in black people with aphasia than white individuals with aphasia. And so this was an interaction between an individual's race and their lesion size. So even though black individuals may have had a large stroke, they still had they still performed worse than white stroke survivors that had a larger stroke. And so we had a couple of suggestions on why this could happen. So this is a picture of the picnic scene in, uh-oh, let's see. Okay, so this is a picture of the Western aphasia battery pic picnic scene, which often individuals are asked to describe as part of the assessment battery. And so one of the things that we suggested in why we were seeing this difference in disparity between black and white stroke survivors was that there was an assessment bias in aphasia outcomes that become more evident with larger strokes due to the cognitive load. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. So is there a cognitive load when you're code switching? So I googled picnic, white picnic, and this picture came up here, which resembles a lot of the Western aphasia battery picture. You have a slide, you have water, here are the kites. And then when I googled black picnic, this is what came up. And this is a little bit more familiar of what I was exposed to growing up. You have um, the water here, you have Uncle Ray on the grill here. And so there is this idea that some of this disparity that we see in our assessment outcomes could be due to an assessment bias. And so in turn, a picture description task that does not include semantic experiences that are relevant to the client may decrease the use of available language. And so one of the things that I talk a lot to our clinicians about is really understanding the cultural experiences and narratives of some Black stroke survivors. So if we think about what we know as individuals that have lived in America, individuals between the age of 20 to 84 grew up around this area here. And so this, the civil rights movement, um, some may have even grown up during segregation. And so we have to recognize when we're working with black stroke survivors that there may be a level of medical mistrust that in the field of speech pathology, we know that there's a lack of clinician race concordance as black clinicians are 3.6% of the profession or uh, only 3% of the SLPs identify as black.
And so I, I tell this story about how there was, I was a clinical supervisor. I did my PhD at the University of Georgia. And one of the students remarked on how the client didn't make eye contact with her. And she was ready to mark that as a deficit. And I had to remind her that during the time, because it was an older gentleman, during that time, making eye contact with a white person could get you killed. And so sometimes we have to recognize that it may not be due to deficit, but because of um, the culture. Lastly, I want to share a study that I did with you as part of my dissertation study, where we looked at the relationship between health related quality of life and social support in African Americans. I wanted to know does aphasia affect health related quality of life differently, depending on the individual social support or social network. And it was a homogeneous sample of Black Americans. We had 13 stroke survivors with aphasia, without aphasia, and then normal aging individuals. And we found that there was no difference in social network between the stroke survivors and the healthy aging. And that a small social network size was normal for Black Americans. And that aphasia does not predict a social network size. And so what this means clinically is that communication should be targeted in social context to support health related quality of life in African Americans with aphasia. And I want to leave you with this um, training must extend beyond African American English and acceptance of dialectal differences to comprehension competency or humility of real differences and experiences that are unique to minoritized groups. I think that that was one of the reasons why when I met Angie, we bonded so well, was because her story was so in line with not only what the research showed, but also what I knew of some of the patients that I had. Thank you so much, and I'm excited for questions. Angie, hi. And tell your story from the beginning. Oh. <laughs> Please. I didn't know. So you're not taking questions right this right. We're gonna do questions at the end. Okay. <laughs> so she's like, tell me, tell me the story, Angie. Tell me your story. <laughs> so um, like um it was when I was introduced. Um hi everyone, my name is Angie Cawthorn. Um, on May 17th, uh, 2017, I suffered and survived two strokes. I was um, manager of uh, one of the larger dealerships in the country and actually in, well, in this area, but in the country. Uh, shout out to Reed Toll. Okay. And um, when I got home, I got home relatively early that night and I went to, uh, I played some, played my video game, played a little 2K and then I went to go take my medication. When I went to go take my medication, I realized my hand wouldn't close. I couldn't close my hand. And I called out to my husband and I said, uh, honey, I need your help. And it came out. Rah, rah, ah, bah, bah. And I'm like, well, that's, that's odd. So I reached, tried to reach again and my hand won't do what I'm telling it to do. So I mentally try to, assess everything like how do I feel do I have a headache no I'm, I'm good I'm good but I get to my husband and I tell him bottom line we need to call 911 he called 911 and uh they get here and they tell me um it's probably nothing you're probably just having a panic attack my face is literally kind of on the side a little bit not as straight as you know there was definitely something going wrong I couldn't close my hand and I couldn't speak. Now that's three out of the th th four that you get for fast. As a professional, I need this young man to kind of know that that's in retrospect, but you know, he told me, um, you know, I'll take you if you want to go, like if I want to make a national a case about it, I'll, I'll take you to the hospital, but it's probably just a panic attack. You probably just need to get some sleep. And he, they took me to, the um 
while I'm in the ambulance, they're asking me my name, my social. And I'm like, my social is 25844. And I'm like, wait a minute, there's not a two or eight in my social at all. I couldn't spell my name. And I'm like, well, this is just trippy. This is crazy. I never lost consciousness or anything like that. So I get to the hospital and this young man is kind of telling the nurse that um, I'm probably just, and he's pretty much telling her to disregard me. Like, don't even worry about that. She's just having a, a weird night. Um, so they take me in um, and they put me in the waiting room. And I, I'm in the waiting room for a decent amount of time. And then they finally take me back. They do the scan. And then they put me up in the room like hours, hours later. And in that following morning, the lady comes to me and she says, well, you've had not, she said, you've had a stroke. And I said, well, you like a, a mild stroke. She said, no, you've had two full strokes. And uh, I'm like, he, he, the guy said I was probably just having a panic attack. While I'm in the hospital, I couldn't talk and they treated me like I was a crackhead. Um, I was dressed for nighttime. And um, the doctors in the ER had to tell my husband, go tell these gentlemen I speak for a living. Go tell them I'm a finance manager for the one of the largest. I probably sold this guy his car. Go tell him I'm not an idiot. I just can't talk well now. And they treated me like, of course you can't talk. Um, you know, you're, you're a half a person anyway, so it doesn't matter. It was really... Um, uh, how they just, because I, and it was clearly the only thing that was different about me is, was my use of language. And that's kind of what is, um, really, uh, sparred me to, um, do the advocacy that I'm doing is to fix some of those things that I saw going wrong in my own experience. I went, I finally got out of there. I made it to my after a few uh, long times, I got to my speech language pathologist and she was, um, she was sweet. She was nice, but she was, um, what is word? She was um, not helping me find the next step after I left her care. Um, it was all about say pancake and say this word, say pen. And I'm like, okay, pen. But she wasn't addressing what was going on in my head. I could always talk fairly good. Um, I could get it together. But what was going on in my head, I had a friend of mine say this last, yesterday. They said it's like, a duck, a, a swan is swimming gracefully on the water, but the work that they're doing under the water, they are going nuts under the water. And that's how it is um, when you have aphasia and you have to talk. Um, I found that the lack of resources that were available uh, to the African-American community were, were lacking. Um, we weren't being informed about the research that was that really helped me. Um, long story short, I will shorten this up so we can get to Dr. Ellis. But um, I went and got into a support group. And one thing I do find, luckily, the SLP had a, a flyer up for me to see about the support group. And But she didn't encourage it. She didn't say, hey, this is something you might want to and even I was out of times to pay. We were going to privately pray, but she read, there was really nothing else that she could really do to help me. And so she just, you know, cut me loose. And luckily I saw that flyer and I finally stumbled into an Adler aphasia um, support group. And that lady who was running the group um, introduced me to the people at Temple, which introduced me to research. And that's where I got my greatest gains. That's where the time was put in. And if I didn't stumble in, and that's why I created the organization that I'm working with now, Arch, I'm the co-founder and uh, president of It's So folks that uh, maybe don't have all the money and all the resources can still tap in 
and get taken care of and not be not allow um, our zip code, our skin color, our color, our creed to be a deficit to finding quality health care and getting the help that we need and deserve. So that's my story. Hopefully I uh, gave you all you needed there. <laughs> I told him from the beginning, Dr. Celeste and uh, Dr. Ellis, we can uh, help us out. All right. So, yeah, thank you. Um, that was perfect. Um, I just want to talk a, just a few minutes and build on what has already been said. And I and I wrote down what Miss Angie said. She said her therapist was she was sweet and she was nice. But and then she paused. Um, I think that's kind of what I've been concerned about over the last 30 years. If we go to the hospital or if we go to a physician um, of course, we want them to be sweet and nice, but we also want them to understand what they're doing and how it applies to us as an individual person, as opposed to just a person with aphasia. And so I, I find myself even now saying to my students who are training to become speech pathologists that th these aren't just clients with aphasia. These are these are real people. And, and I need you to start with understanding that these are real people. And if they're real people, then I need you to treat them the way that you would your mom or your grandma. And if you can't do them, can't do that, then treat them the way that you would think that I would expect you to treat my mom or my grandma, who are both deceased, but I have a very high standard um, for them. And I have been concerned that as we as we um, become a much more diverse world, that people with conditions like aphasia are sometimes just getting lost in the mix of all the change that's 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 happening, and that um, we oftentimes just want a cookie cutter approach to dealing with people when people are very, very complex. I added these two pictures because this is kind of the current face of, of aphasia. And although uh, both of these individuals have primary progressive aphasia and we're, we're more focused tonight on post-stroke aphasia, we're, we're concerned about all individuals with aphasia, but I think the three of us have a, a special interest in stroke that, um, People need to understand this more, that this is that there are millions of people in the U.S. that have aphasia and they come from all walks of life. These are these are older people. These are younger people. These are black people. These are white people. These are Hispanic people. And that you can't necessarily approach each person in the same way that there are factors or characteristics that we all have that we must tap into. And if we don't understand this concept of, of diversity, then we can become too focused on equality. And that may sound that, well, of course we want equality, but equality means that everyone gets the same thing. Really in aphasia, we we need people to to, to get equitable care. And equitable care says that an individual, and I'm paraphrasing this, they get specifically what they need. Um, so aphasia is one of the many health-related uh, conditions that we must understand this difference of equity versus equality and to help move the study of aphasia, aphasia treatments, aphasia assessments, um, to a place where there's there's equitable um, care so that each person gets exactly what they need and what they deserve. Now, I do want to clarify, this is not a discussion about race, that oftentimes the focus is on, on racial differences, but we know from the study of stroke and the study of aphasia that there are differences between men and women. There are differences between individuals who live in urban cities and those who live in rural areas. There's differences in access. 
So if you give everyone the exact same thing, like you see on the top, that won't work for some individuals. That in, in, in our focus on aphasia, we really do have to focus on equity. And that might look very different across um, different individuals. The reason that I believe that is important is very few studies have tapped into this area. And as a result, very little of the thoughts that we have about equitable care, even from the general healthcare literature, has not necessarily translated into how we manage, treat, or intervene with people with, with aphasia, that we just have not done a good job, even when we know that there are differences in how different individuals with aphasia respond to different types of treatments in the same way that we know that um, different patients with high blood pressure respond to different types of high blood pressure medication, that there are there are some medications that it's well established that they do not perform well um, in African Americans, but they might perform well in white Americans. In the same way, we know that there's classes of, of, of medications for blood pressure that perform well in men, but they don't perform well in women. So this concept of, of equity, it has to translate into what we're focused on right now, which is understanding aphasia. So it simply means that in our approaches to research and in our approaches to clinical management, we've, we've got to move beyond just black white differences and understand that um, people are people are very complicated and they they're the they're the product of their life experiences. And I'll, I'll give you an example. So as a, as a professor and department chair, I have excellent health insurance and I get excellent medical care at the university. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that the first 18 to 20 years of my life, I lived in poverty and I didn't have excellent medical care. So my health-related outcomes are not simply the fact that as a middle-aged man, I have great insurance and great health care. It's the cumulative effect of my entire life. Aphasia is much like that, that two people um, come to the table with very different characteristics that they would have had before the onset of their aphasia. Um, and people come to the table with different beliefs and attitudes. So as, as practitioners, as physiologists, as people who care about these conditions, we have to really um, think about the complexity of people and how that drives some of the outcomes that we see. And I know in, even in my short career, there were probably times that the outcome for the person with aphasia was excellent and it had absolutely nothing to do with the care or treatment that I provided. And there were probably other times that I did an excellent job and the outcome was, was, was not excellent. So it's a combination of understanding people, people with aphasia, and kind of their life story. And ultimately that is going to, to translate in, um, into uh, better outcomes for people with aphasia. So if I could go back um, to Miss Angie's thoughts that I, I'm, I'm hoping that at some point in this process that um, clinicians are more than uh, sweet and nice that we have thought about the complexity of people and that um, and that we use all of this gain, this, this knowledge that we've gained to help facilitate the best outcomes. And then the final thing that I tell my students is that as, as SLPs, we need to learn to talk less and listen more, that we can be so focused on, on what we're trying to um, tell the person with aphasia that we're trying to help 
that we miss a great opportunity to hear from them what we should be focused on to, to, to help them. And so all of this is just part of understanding the complexity of people so that we're much more than just sweet and nice. Miss Angie, I'm gonna use that for the rest of my career. <laughs> I'm gonna need to be cited, so just make sure. <laughs> Nothing's for free. <laughs> Listen, this is, <laughs> um, can I uh, piggyback on what you just said, though? Absolutely. Um, as a patient, um, you know, aphasia, what I found when I wrote this, when I, I wrote this a while ago, um, and I'm just going to share it with you. I wrote, uh, because brain damage is so global and aphasia is just one part of the total package we have fatigue as stroke survivors we have fatigue like headedness vertigo stiff muscles difficulty walking muscle problems involuntary eye movements and that's just to name a few and then we on top of that we are um we we really don't understand because quite frankly there is so much broken and we're on overload because it's just too much broken at one time. Um, we don't know until we try and fail miserably that the things that we can't do, you know? So those things that when you tell your clients, your, I'm sorry, your students th about going into the cave with the client, go and support them and don't expect them to always be able to come out. Sometimes you have to go in. Um, because that swelling is just going down the physical aspects by the time you're being released is just around the time that you can actually absorb something. So just to kind of keep that in mind and not to just come in saying that I haven't lost any intelligence and that I'm just the same because I'm not the same. I'm not the same. And I'm, I can, uh, six, seven years later, I can appreciate that I'm still just as intelligent and it didn't affect my intelligence, but a month out, no, no, I don't think that at all. I think that's, a, I think that's a bad statement to make. So that would be the only thing I would say to share with your, uh, your students. Consider it done. Yes, sir. So I think we're at a point now um, that we'd like to hear from the audience to see what questions you have. And maybe there's some already in the chat. I am horrible at following the chat. Yeah, no worries. We'll keep an eye on the chat for you. That was really fascinating what each of you shared with us. So thank you so much. We have a lot of great feedback in the chat, like powerful research. Thank you for your advocacy. So relatable, excellent, and lots of thank yous. Um, so one question I'll open up to the panel. Um, someone submitted the question, what is the roadmap like for aphasia rehabilitation tools that are inclusive of an other than white middle class patient? And they gave some examples of barriers. Most resources are in English and assume a Western upbringing. Speech therapists may approach with a one size fits all mentality comorbidities. Um, so thoughts. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a big question. <clears throat> I would, I would say the, um, I, I would say there's probably no roadmap. And so I'll have to <clears throat> wait to hear from my um, co-presenters here. I, I would say that there's, there's not a roadmap that there is, um, there's, um, definitely good intentions to think about um, some of the diversity issues that exist in aphasia, but I think we've been at the talking stage for a long time. In, in 2000, we said in 2030, we're gonna be a very more diverse um, country. And now we're almost at 2030, we're six years away. So now we're talking about 2050. And in that in that 24 year time period, 
we have had a, a, a lot of discussions about these issues, but not a lot of movement in terms of developing new assessment approaches, um, not a lot of movement in thinking about the differences and beliefs and attitudes of, of people from different population groups and how that translates into patient provider um, interactions. We, we have made some improvements of documenting pretty clearly that there are differences um, between people based on race and sex and gender, that we, we, we know that recovery patterns for women oftentimes can look very different than uh, recovery patterns for men with the same type of stroke or the same type of aphasia. So it's a, um, but I, I still think we're on the, the, the front end of just understanding the complexity of aphasia that derives from um, a very complex condition, which is stroke, which is tied into kind of the life course that people don't just wake up one day and have a stroke that we we've learned that there is a process that that takes you there. So I'm going to stop right there and and get some but that's a big big question. Yeah. I would say one of the things that I think is important and often underutilized is patient reported outcomes. You know, when I was a clinician and I didn't learn this as much going through the process, which is that, you know, you have insurance demands, you have all these other factors that come into play. And so a survivor may not have the opportunity to go through your entire battery or get to whatever goals you as the clinician, you know, feel are important before their insurance dollars run out. And so I think sometimes, you know, checking in with the patient, doing those patient reported outcomes and having them decide what are some things they want to be able to do, whether it's talk on the phone or read a Bible scripture out loud at church or whatever it is, and then gearing your therapy toward that, I think can be a positive indicator and create a level of success um, for survivors. I think there's a lot to, there's still a lot to be understood. And I, I know that there are clinicians on here, researchers, uh, and we've seen this, the evidence-based triangle for the last 25 or 30 years. And one side of that triangle is patient beliefs and, and attitudes. And that rarely gets integrated into the um, treatment approach um, or, or integrated into the, the current state of the evidence that we have mm -hmm. today. Because one, it's very, very difficult to understand uh, beliefs and attitudes because it's oftentimes um, more important of what the person is not saying than what they're saying uh, that gives you some insights into their beliefs and attitudes. Mm -hmm. Angie, you talk a lot about that. I, I know you've said that before that with aphasia, it's what you, it's not so much what you know, it's what you prove, you can prove that you know. That's right. And you can take me on that as well. Um, no, but it is, it does come down to, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove, you know, and back to the person's question, I would say you can always, which Dr. Celeste taught me, you can change your person. Yeah. If you're not getting what you want from your provider, then you can make a change to make um, them different. Mm -hmm. Call and and ask for what you want. I mean, you might get lucky and get the person that speaks your your native tongue. I mean, um, aphasia, you know, to have a person that you don't even vibe with it's one thing to not to care for them or not to like them, but it's a whole nother thing if you have a complete disconnect because mm -hmm. you're already disconnected. You mm -hmm. should not have to um to have to fight that fight as well. So mm -hmm. I that's that's gotta be um a, a definite challenge. But 
my recommendation would be to make that change. And it is true. You are judged by not what you know, but what you can prove you know. And with aphasia, I can't prove I know anything. There's no proof. I can't prove I know how to add $10 to this tip. Either I can add $10 to $84 or I can't. And then like, see, she don't know. <laughs> so absolutely. I think that's a very powerful statement to um, explain to people with aphasia that they do, that they do have a choice. I think in, in healthcare, uh, relationships or interactions, it's we oftentimes feel we're at the mercy of the of the system. And um that's that's not not always the case. Probably not, it's probably rarely that it's the case. We just don't know that we have um options. It goes right back to treat the person the way you would my mom or grandma. I've been married a long time. I have fired my wife's doctors, many of them because I didn't like the way that they approached her or handled her. Um, I don't necessarily recommend that everyone on this call do that, but I would, I do those kind of things for people that I love. So I love that. you do have a choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, again, it's about recognizing when Dr. Celeste mentioned it to me, she was like, well, you could have just left. And I'm like, I could have. I had no idea. And my husband works for the insurance company. He's been, uh, he works for a large insurer for a long time, but it didn't even dawn on me. Um, but it was such a hard time to even get the appointments. But again, while you're mid avalanche, while you're mid storm coming out of this aphasia fog, this brain fog you're in, you don't even know that you don't really like the lady or that she's not connecting with you. You don't even have enough to make that assessment. You know, so. And I think for our cl clinician family out there too, that's not being critical. If if I'm working with a client, I don't want to be fired by a client. I want to feel that, I want them to feel that I am giving everything that I know about this. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I don't want to be fired. <laughs> Uh, so it's, it's not being, but sometimes we can, we can be so focused on, um, the thing that we're focused on, that we're not focused on the person. Right. And then oftentimes that's where the, the rapport is built, the bridge is built and, and, and where the magic happens for the aphasia outcome. Yeah. Say pancake. <laughs> Exactly. That was her thing. Say I'm in there with all kinds of problems and say pancake. But it's also hard for the um, speech pathologist to, with the mental health problems that you come in with, how does that help? You know what I mean? She's dealing with me. She's not, um, it's not her job to, for the mental health side that I was ill prepared for, but it all came out in her office. Mm -hmm. So it puts her at a disadvantage. And then I'm gonna fire her because she's not, it's, it gets, it's, it's true. And round and round we go. <laughs> yeah. We have another question um, from someone in our audience. What efforts are happening to attract persons of color, and we can probably expand an even more, you know, diverse group of people into the speech therapy field. Any thoughts? <laughs> Dr. Alice, you go. <laughs> I knew that was going to fall to me. It's, you know, I, I, I think it's a hard, it, it's a hard question to answer. I, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, our, our national organization, ASHES, you know, they're, they've been talking about this since I've been in the profession and, and been doing, and they're, they're great programs um, out there. Um, but it, I, th I think because some of the things that, um, that we, or the conditions that we work with, like aphasia, is considered like low prevalence and low incidence relative to the number of people with diabetes or that have heart attacks, um, but the 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 impact is significant. So it may not be as happening as frequently, 
as a, with the number of people with diabetes, but the, the impact because communication is, is our gateway to independence. It, it really is. If, if you can, you can communicate, then you can take advantage of a lot of ADA laws because they're designed to deal with kind of the physical aspect. But once you lose the communication, um, it, it, eliminates it creates barriers even for something that's very this very positive so i i i think the push has to be much earlier than trying to find juniors and seniors to go into graduate programs that people have to be exposed to it in in the high schools and definitely um as freshmen mm -hmm. um, and and we're we're dealing with that here at uf and i'm I'm scared to death that you know students are going to come into the major as um, freshmen without a clear understanding of where this is all going. But at the same time, that's exactly what we need to happen so that they can have the um, exposures to to make more informed more informed decisions. Um, I think the other part of it is kind of what we're what we're doing right now that that if you're trying to diversify something, then people have to see diversity. They they just do. Um, and so the, the whole process becomes very difficult and it can appear that that there's no one doing anything, but there's people are doing a a lot. We just haven't found the right kind of combination of ways to increase diversity. Mm -hmm. And I'll add to that. I would say um, for Black speech pathologists that are there or members of, of, of underrepresented groups to reach out. Um, I know when I met Angie, she said that I was the first Black speech pathologist that she met. And I was like, what, really? Um, and even when I was getting my PhD at the University of Georgia, I actually met a linguistics major uh, in Sephora and we were talking and she was like, you know, I wanted to be a speech pathologist, but I applied several times and I never got in and I invited her to help me collect my dissertation research. And so that was her first time getting exposure to people with aphasia. She took my research seminar course, and then even in applying to grad school, she was able to get into a speech pathology program, a master's program, and that experience that she had as a linguistics major, but working closely with me with speech pathology students was very, very beneficial to her. And so I would say, you know, reach back and, and definitely mentor. That's wonderful. Um, I think some folks are wondering about resources. Um, I don't know, Angie, you have, are on every board and <laughs> have started every organization. Can you all speak to a couple of the resources, especially now that there's so many virtual offerings, you know, even the aphasia conversation group that's through the NAA, the Black American aphasia conversation group, um, speak to some of the resources for both people with aphasia. Also, I've gotten a question about care partners who are looking for more information. I will jump in here and uh, add a little something to that. The um... First of all, obviously, we're all here for the N the NAA call, so we all know what the NAA does and what they bring. They do have a brand new website. Please go check that out. Uh, there is ARCH. Depending upon where you live, it might be a little more specific to you. I would encourage anybody that is on this call uh, that is looking to improve what's going on with your speech is to tap into a support group at the hospital tap into um, uh, research at universities and speak with the people that are in charge of the communication disorders and ask them do they through their uh, generally have a, 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 a clinic situation or they're doing research and a lot of research is online uh, of course there is arch hello I see you in the chat I appreciate you <laughs> aphasia research research Re aphasia resource.org is the website for arch 
Uh, we just put out our February newsletter, which will tell you all the different um, things that are in the South Jersey, Philadelphia, uh, Delaware area. And it's, um, but again, the most important thing I would say is uh, there's a national synergy. If you're in Rhode Island, there's just ask. Um, Mac, I'm actually wearing uh, his band right now. It says, get the word out of Asia. And I think that's just a, an amazing uh, tagline. But it's all about tapping in and finding your community, finding your tribe, find, finding your fellow Asians that will help you get through this journey. Because the Dr. Ellis's and the Dr. Celeste's of the world are the unicorns. They're the, they're just special, you know? So you don't have them all the time, but you do have resources. And when I say they're special, I'm, my uh, aphasia is kicking in. What I want to say is you don't have them all the time, but you will have your fellow aphasians mm -hmm. in the support groups because um, we're there. But the Black Aphasians call, which is every other Monday um, for African-Americans, and it's just a place where we uh, chop it up, have a good time. Dr. Celeste comes sometimes and shares with us. Uh, but the NAA website, just see what appeals to you, the cafe, all those different things, and just see where you can plug in um, and and realize that there's a waiting aphasia community that is waiting to to help you get through this rough part. And it's just the rough part. I promise you it gets better. It gets easier. And it's just about staying positive and doing what you have to do. So that's what okay. I have. Also check in on the NAA website regularly. It's going to gone through a major overhaul over the last six to eight months. And there's constantly new information there and you know one of the goals is that you know that will be the premier place that you will go to for for anything aphasia related and resources so check there regularly yeah and the naa is really actively asking you all what do you want to see on the website what can we do to make things more accessible for you so um, i saw that Amara um, shared in the chat, you can email that answers at aphasia.org with any questions, suggestions, feedback, like we are here for you. And it's already 758. Time has flown. So I think, again, if you have any other questions, definitely send us an email, but I think we're going to start wrapping up our conversation here. Thank you to everybody who submitted questions. Thank you to everyone who is here attending. And a huge thank you to our panelists, Dr. Ellis, Dr. Celeste, and Angie. Thank you so much for sharing your time, your expertise with us, and all your different perspectives on clinical diversity issues in aphasia. Obviously, this is a very important conversation that we need to continue to have. So thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. For more info on the National Aphasia Association, you can visit us at our website, www.aphasia.org. For more information on our virtual events, such as this one, and also you'll find the Black American Aphasia Conversation Group. Their next meeting is on Monday afternoon. Go to www.aphasia.org backslash online dash events. Again, Please email questions, suggestions, feedback about aphasia to answers at aphasia.org and any comments, feedback, or suggestions for Ask the Expert to me at Catherine at aphasia.org. Next month, our Ask the Expert webinar is going to be Thursday, March 14th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to have another panel of experts, and this time they are from our Parenting with Aphasia conversation group. So they're sharing experiences, tips, resources related to parenting with aphasia. So that's about all for tonight. Thank you all for spending some time with us. We hope to see you next time. Have a great rest of your evening. Bye. Thank you.